Good evening. <clears throat> there are actually probably none of us who really want to be here this evening. We'd much rather if Ambrose hadn't left us. However, it's happened and we must get on with life. We would feel sad for ourselves, for his family, and also Ambrose. He left a gaping gap in our lives. I also feel very sad for the people that never knew Ambrose, because he brought a special joy to anyone that knew him, and anyone that didn't know him and meet him and encounter him will have enough stories and good memories to last for the rest of their lives. There are a few people here that would like to say a few words about Ambrose, that spent time with Ambrose and knew him very well. The first one is John. You'd like to say a couple of words there. <laughs> Excuse me if I struggle to get through a bit of this, but we try. So, we're gathered here today in celebration and gratitude of a life full of energy, passion, charisma, and fun. There was something to behold. Ambrose's death was sudden, but his life was not faint. He's the last person I would have expected to pass away at far too, far too young an age of 55 years old. But at the same time, Ambrose probably lived, to 100, lived 150 years in the 55 years he had. So, many of you would have known Ambrose, Irish Ambrose, but I knew him international Ambrose. I first met him about 30 years ago, and that was in Dubai. It was midday, midweek, and it was in the KTM motorbike shop. Neither of us should have been there. I should have been at work, and Ambrose had come to Dubai to have a look at Dubai before he moved to, to uh, Emirates Airlines. He should have been actually out looking for accommodation for his family, but he was in the motorbike shop. Ambo's passion for aviation resonates worldwide, and he himself is known globally in the industry. He has always inspired and encouraged so many people in the world of flying, from the Turkish cadets who came to join with us today, that he had placed in Cork Airport, to sons and daughters of friends in Ireland and as far away as in El Salvador in Central America. I want to share with you a little story that's really Ambrose's story because there, there are so many stories um, in the aviation industry, in the biking industry that I could tell. I'm going to tell you a story that he told me many, many years ago. Um, and it's when he was training to be a pilot at Baldonnell. And he had got, started getting his first couple of flights and the first few were short and then the, the training uh, um, officer said to him, we're going to do a little bit of longer flight today now, so you can do three or four hundred kilometers and um, you decide where you want to go. So Ambrose told me that, he did, this is back in the, probably the mid 80s, when there weren't telephones, uh, communications, internet, all the easy communication that we have now. Ambrose told me that, of course he was going to fly to Mayo. Where else would he go? First long distance flight. So he and his instructor, they flew down to Mayo, they overflew the home farm, and then they came back and they buzzed the farm. He went as low as he possibly could. And then he turned around and he did it again, back across the farm. Then he flew back up to Dublin, full of excitement, landed in Baldano, no telephone there. A couple of hours had passed by the time he filled in his log, drove back up to Dublin to the bed sit where he was living. He said uh, he was just so full of excitement having done this first long distance flight. He went up to the, apartment, the, the flat he was staying in, got some coins, came down to the old telephone box, the dial single digit, recoil, called home, and at this stage it was about 8.30 at night. And his father, the other Ambrose, answered the phone. And the first thing Ambrose said was, did you see me today? And he said, was that you, yes, so-and-so? We spent the whole day getting the ball out of the slurry pan. <laughs> So that took the wind out of Ambrose. <laughs> Ambrose has passed away from this world doing what he loved most, riding motorcycles. Continuing 
he's worldwide exploring in countries and cultures, but especially engaging with the people who we met along the way. Along with our team, Jim, Phil, Ken, Kimo, and Mustafa, we've traveled literally hundreds of countries down through Africa and Central America and motorbikes and South America. There was never a dull moment with Amros on these trips. In fact, he lived his life at full speed on his own high aviation fuel. He would constantly be on the go. It was impossible to keep up with his antics and scheming. They were at such speed that he regularly found himself in all kinds of bother at his very own creation. But Ambrose was the master of improvise and ad lib. He would somehow, yet again, find a way out of trouble. He loved his motorbikes, and he himself probably didn't know how many bikes he had scattered around the world. There's one in South Africa, one in California, one in Mexico, he has one in Dublin, and he recently bought one in France as well. But he also found time to help others as well. Ambrose has done an enormous amount of charitable work um, regularly with the Hospice Africa in Uganda. And last year, he was part of a group of us when we drove across Kenya delivering five ambulances and five fire brigades to the government in Kampala, which was a gift from the Japanese government organized by Willie Nagoya, who's actually come here from Tokyo today to be with us and be with Ambrose. What will I miss most with Ambrose? The fun we had planning and doing trips. My friend, the person that I would pick up the phone to call first. And the person with, with whom I now will mourn and celebrate. His memory will always be with us. And his legacy will continue through the first load of his life. His family, Anne, Avine, Neve, Anna Rose, and his grandson Killian, who he absolutely adored. Ambrose would smile if he was with us here today. He'd have a funny story to tell to make everybody comfortable, to entertain us with his scheming in particular. The world has a little less mischief in it without Ambrose. If we could only again hear his infectious laugh, then we could for a moment forget our deep sadness. I will miss my friend dearly, as we all will, but I'm also so grateful for having known him. Ambrose has friends everywhere. Testimony to that are the people who have traveled from far and wide to be here with us today, from as far as Wales, Dubai, Australia, United States, Germany, Japan, and Turkey. You know, there were no strangers in Ambrose's life. There were only the friends that he had not yet met. Fly high, my dear friend. We have lost a great man, we will miss you. Your legacy will endure for generations. You fought for others so well, you inspired so many. You love so deeply, and you also live so loudly. We that ever knew you can never forget you, Ambrose. I'd just like to say to finish that thank you, particularly to um, Ken McGreevy, Mustafa from Turkey, and my sons Connor and Tiernan for being the Bring Ambrose home team from Mexico. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Ken, are you <laughs> in the area? This is Ken Reed, another traveling companion of Sam Brothers. I'm actually a second traveler. I'm a second traveler. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Ken Reed is my name. Um, I haven't prepared, prepared anything, and uh, just like Ambrose, I'm going to wing it, and hopefully I'll have him on my shoulder, you know. Uh, I only know Ambrose five or six years, and a wise person said to me once, people come into your life for a reason, a season, or for life. And it's usually one of those things. Ambrose ticked all of those boxes, and he ticked all of those boxes for all of us too. And to be here today is so surreal. And it's, it's like, I don't know, I, I haven't felt this way since the loss of my own father many, many, many years ago. Um, and I know a lot of people here is, are hurting, hurting, hurting really, really bad. 
But I used to call this guy uh, to my family like Special Agent Lane because you wouldn't know where he was nor what he was doing. <laughs> I heard a story one time, I think it was in Peru, where the boys, where, where Jim and Finn and John and Ambrose got into a particular screen and it was, if, if you were to screenwrite it for the born identity, you couldn't do it better. Ecuador, Ecuador. And it, it, Jim, Jim, I'm sure, would tell it more better than me, where they had people going into this police compound to try and repatriate a bike that, of course, was questionably registered and whatnot. And there was guys secreted in the boot of the car, and different people were tasked with diverting security guards and diverting security cameras. And it was, it was like Escape from Alcatraz. The way these guys got away with the bikes and headed for the border. I think Phil McBride probably had a huge um, thing to do with this, and no doubt it was one of his uh, well thought out plans. But Ambrose, um, I think it was Pat Bridget, I don't know if Pat is here, we spoke at, um, at the funeral home or at, the, at the, the, the mass this morning, and he, he said it very well. He says, Ambrose has something that every person in the world wants, every management consultant wants every businessman wants. He says, I don't know what it is. I don't know where you get it. I don't know where you can buy it. But by God, he has it. And if we could have just 1% of what Ambrose Blaine had, you'd be a perfect man. And that's what he was. I know he had his flaws, but by God, what a character, what a friend, uh, you know, a husband, a dad, a granddad. He brought Killian uh, up to me one day in the, in the Garda station in Mount Hyde. And then we had the best of laugh. And I know Killian got a great buzz out of it, but by God, Ambrose, every time I meet him, he was there saying how good it was and how just the crack. You know, and that was Ambrose. Um, Johnny Doyle was telling me another story that um, in some other far from place, Ambrose got a bad burn from the exhaust in Kenya. And he, his, he got a, like, a very bad burn in his hand. And, you know, not a fuss, not a nothing, like a proper, like, you know, I'd be a complete wuss. And we'd all be looking for sympathy and looking for hopes and kisses off Big Phil McBride, but not a bother on him and just winged it and went on. And that's that's Ambrose. So, you know, he's he's made a huge impact on my life. I thought I was a complete bluffer till I met him. And the stories <laughs> of schmoozing and cruising and boozing and all the stuff that we do. Um, I was telling um, the girls last night that even meet, uh, when we were meeting Ambrose prior to the accident, in a place called Loretto. Um, I, was, I was actually getting kind of those butterflies in my tummy, just with the excitement, because we'd have a huge cross interest in, in politics and geopolitics, and Ambrose would say, no, you got that all wrong. This is what the Gaddafis did. This is what such and such did. And I said, how do you know? Because they told me. <laughs> and he was, you know, absolute, absolute, huge loss to everybody. And I know he wouldn't, want us to be sad here today and um, but unfortunately that's that's just the way we are and it's a huge huge loss particularly to, to Anne and the girls and to Kitty you know so my friend we'll we'll see you as I say we'll see you on the far side. Mm -hmm. Just a little story I want to tell about. Uh, one time, my nan and himself had a pub in Mayo. We went up, and uh, it was coming near the end of the night, and someone came in looking for a few slabs of beer for a house party. And naturally enough, I thought Ambrose invited. Well, they invited Ambrose back, and we tagged along. We went back to a house on the outside of Kalala, and. Uh, what we couldn't understand was how we got such attention in the house. No matter if we moved from one room to another, the followed us, kept an eye on us, never took their eye off us. <laughs> About three o'clock that night when we were leaving and we came out, Ambrose, he rolled around the place laughing. He had told the people of the house that we were either settled or unsettled travellers <laughs> <laughs> and to keep an eye on them. <laughs> that was him. Um, Kimo, do you want to say a few words? Kimo is here. Uh, oh, no, not here. 
Okay. Um, no, no, it's fine. No? For Amanda was so accomplished <laughs> and so competent in most ways, he could be a complete scatterbrain. Um, I've often, and I'll, his travelling companions will attest to this, we'll come out in the morning from wherever we stay at, we get on the bikes, ready to go, we turn on the bikes, and the next thing we come over at Ambrose, and here he'd be. He forgot the keys. <laughs> the next thing, back into the house, or the hotel, or wherever it was, he'd come back out, rush out, turn on the key, realise he hadn't the helmet and back in again. But that was Ambrose, and uh, he's left a big hole in all our lives, and on a very personal level, I'd miss him. I'd miss the 12 o'clock at night phone call with some other harebrained scheme for getting across the Mexican border. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you all anyway, and uh, is there anyone else wants to say a word? Okay, thank you very much.